Well, Happy New Year to everyone. I hope the new year has started uh, well for each one of you. Um, thankful for another year that God has given us, and uh, excited to be here with you again this morning. Well, Jesus once said that in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must have faith like a child. I remember one day when I was a little boy, when I had uh, a lot of faith. Uh, It wasn't faith in God. It was more faith in myself and and what I thought I could do. Uh, I was nine years old, and I was outside of my school with my, my classmates. And in front of the school, there used to be this really tall, tall tree. But recently they had chopped it down, uh, but not completely down. There was the tree stump was was about uh, this high. I don't remember how high it was. Um, So me and my friends are looking at the tree stump, and I said, hey, I bet I can jump over this this tree stump. I don't know why I said it. Maybe it was to impress them. Maybe there was a girl standing there that I liked, and I wanted to impress her. I don't don't remember, But, but I said it. And everyone said, no, that's too high. You can't jump over that. To which I said, watch me. Watch me jump over it. And before I tried to jump over this tree stump, I don't remember having any fear. I don't remember having any any doubts. I really thought I could do it. You know, so I backed up, revved up, started running, and then I made my jump. And I wish I could tell you this morning that You know, I jumped over the tree stump easily, and everyone cheered, and everybody was impressed. But that isn't what happened that day. My legs didn't even make it over the tree stump. My my, my shin uh, hit the the tree stump. It pierced my skin. Uh, I fell onto the ground. Blood started going everywhere, running down into my sock. I can't remember if I cried or if I tried to be tough and act like it didn't bother me. But someone found a teacher who ran over and, you know, stopped the bleeding. And if you look at my leg today, you can still see a bit of the the scar uh, from that jump that day. Well, needless to say, I never tried to jump over that tree again. In fact, since that day, I haven't really tried to jump over too many things because I learned my lesson. You could say that day I learned uh, my limitations. I learned what I could do. But more importantly, I learned the things that I could not do. And this is part of growing up, right? This is part of of maturing. We learn what what we're good at, and we learn what we are not good at. We learn what we are capable of and what we are not capable of. This is normal, right? That's, That's life. But this can be dangerous when we apply that to our lives spiritually. Can it? This is, it can be dangerous when we consciously or unconsciously start to put limitations on what God can do in our lives. Maybe we don't say it out loud. Maybe we don't even think, think about it. But slowly and surely, we start to put limitations in our mind of what God can do. Maybe that's based on some of our previous experiences Maybe it's because things didn't happen a certain way that they thought they would, or we hoped they would. Of course, we know we can't limit God. God is unlimited. But as we enter into a brand new year, a brand new year I want to challenge you and I want to challenge my, myself uh, to pray for something, to ask for something specifically, to hope for something that we see again and again in the Bible. There is a reason that Jesus told us to have faith like a child. And I want us to consider that this morning. So if you have a Bible, please turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. We also have the text for you on the screen. John chapter 1, beginning in verse uh, 43. So the context here is this is the beginning of Jesus's Uh, earthly ministry. He's gathering and calling his 12 disciples. Right before this, he's just called the disciples uh, Andrew uh, and Peter to himself, and now he's going to call two more. So chapter 1, verse 43. says, the next day Jesus decided to go to, to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, 
follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? But Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus' invitation to, to Philip was, was simple. It's two words. Follow me. Right? That we, we say often that the Christian life, simply put, is following Jesus, listening to his voice through his, his word and, 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 and the Bible, being sensitive to his spirit, following Jesus. We follow Jesus because we know his voice. He goes before us. He leads us. He guides us. We follow him. He protects us. It's a personal relationship. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus said, Come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In John chapter 8, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And later in John chapter, chapter 10, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. The Christian life is following Jesus. And we know from God's word that he will not lead us to bad places. He leads us to good places. He is the good shepherd. He's not the bad shepherd. He cares about his sheep. He cares about you. And he calls you today to follow him just as he called Philip that day. Right? The Christian life is all about Movement. The, the Christian life is about is a, is, a, is a journey. We follow Jesus. We don't just sit with Jesus on a bench our whole lives. He's taking you somewhere. He's leading you, guiding you. Some days it feels like we're running. Some days it feels like we are barely crawling. But following Jesus means that we are still moving, even when we're discouraged or even if we want to quit. So that day, Philip decides to follow Jesus. And he goes and finds his friend, Nathaniel. Now, only here in the Gospel of John is, is he identified as Nathaniel. In the other Gospels, he's called uh, Bartholomew. But Philip goes and finds his, his friend Nathaniel and says, Hey, we found him. We found the Messiah. We found the one who was prophesied by, by Moses, by the prophets. He's here. Jesus of Nazareth is here. But Nathaniel doesn't say, Great, let's go. On the contrary, Nathaniel is skeptical. He's not sure. He says, Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Of course, Nazareth was a, a small city about 80 kilometers north of Jerusalem. And during Jesus' time, there's about 2,000 people that lived there. But apparently, people outside of that city did not have a high opinion of the city. That's why, that's why Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? But instead of Philip getting into a deeper discussion with Nathaniel about Nazareth and the pros and cons and what it's like there and all that stuff, he just tells his friend, hey, come and see. And I think this is a really helpful and good strategy when it comes to evangelism. Sometimes when we talk to friends our friends about Jesus, we can easily become stressed because we think we need to have all of the answers to all of their potential questions. And of course, we should try to, to, to have as many answers as we can. But the strategy from Philip here in John chapter 1 is incredibly simple. It's inviting his friend to meet Jesus, getting his friend to Jesus, leading a person to Christ. For Nathaniel and, and Philip that day, it was physical. He was going to physically take him there. But for us, it's introducing Jesus to our friends through the Bible, inviting them to, to, to church. Come and see is a wonderfully simple invitation, but it's also very, very powerful. Because instead of us feeling like we have to do all of the work, we trust Jesus to do the work in people's hearts. That worked for Philip that day because apparently Nathaniel went with him to meet this Jesus. Verse 47. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him. 
and said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under uh, the fig tree, Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. So Nathanael comes to Jesus, and Jesus says something about him that Nathanael clearly doesn't expect Jesus to know. There is something about the phrase, uh, here comes in the, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no see, deceit. There's something about that that made Nathanael pause. Maybe it was something he was thinking about earlier. Who knows? But it made Nathanael pause and say, hey, how do you know me? And Jesus says, oh, I, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip came and, and, and got you. Now, it's safe to assume that Jesus wasn't hiding in the bushes, you know, with binoculars spying on, on Nathanael. Because that wouldn't have impressed Nathanael so much. What Jesus was doing here was demonstrating his supernatural knowledge. He knew who Nathanael was, even though this was their first physical meeting. Jesus even knew his thoughts. Psalm 139 says that God knows when we sit down and when we stand up. It says that he knows us. He knows our, our thoughts from afar. God knows everything. Even if we can do a good job of hiding things from other people we know, we simply can't hide anything from God. He knows. He knows exactly where you are today, physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally. He knows everything. He knows. But God is not just storing all of this data in some huge warehouse full of hard drives, you know, in case he needs it later. He's not some, you know, tech company that's storing all this data just to, to have it over here. No, God knows everything about you, and God cares. Remember the story of Jesus and the woman at the well, and in some ways, it was a really hard conversation. The truth of this woman's life was open, but it was also, I guarantee you, the best conversation of this woman's life, because she was able to be honest and open, and yet she still felt loved and cared for by Jesus. Maybe her whole life she had been hiding, but in that moment in her conversation with Jesus, when everything was in the open, she felt loved and cared for. She went back to her hometown, and the first thing she told people was, come and see this person who told me everything I ever did. God knows everything that you're going through today. He knows where you've been. He knows where you are. He knows where you're going. He knows your strengths. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your thoughts. The Bible says that he knows the very number of hairs on your head. Isn't it incredible that God knows everything about you and he still invites you and says, come, follow me. When Nathaniel realized that Jesus knew him, he gave one of the first confessions we see in the Gospels of, uh, of that Jesus is the Christ. Nathaniel says, Rabbi, which means teacher, he says, you are the son of God. The Son of God was a title given back in the Old Testament. It doesn't mean that Jesus was, you know, created or born after uh, God the Father, but it's more about the role of Jesus. The Son of God is the same nature of God the Father, but the Son of God is unique because it's God becoming human, which, of course, we just celebrated during Christmas when Jesus was born. So when Nathaniel declares that Jesus is the Son of God, he is saying that this is God here in the flesh, he says that Jesus is the king of Israel. He's the Messiah whom the prophets foretold long ago. Meeting Jesus that day led Nathanael to confess, to recognize who Jesus was, and declare that he is indeed the king of kings. Verse 50. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to him, tr uh, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. It's clear from Jesus' words here that, that Nathanael believed in Jesus because Jesus said that he saw him under the fig tree. Nathanael believed in Jesus because of Jesus' supernatural knowledge. That's what impressed Nathanael that day. 
But Jesus essentially says to Nathanael, oh, you think that was amazing? Oh, you thought that was awesome? I am capable of doing so much, much more. And Jesus promises him, says, Nathanael, you are going to see greater things than these. In verse 51, Jesus gives Nathanael more detail. He says that Nathanael will see heaven open, the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And this is uh, referencing the story of, in the Old Testament in Genesis 28 of, of uh, Jacob's dream, where uh, in the dream he saw a stairway or a ladder reaching up to heaven with angels uh, going up and, and going down. And the message of that dream was that God was making a bridge between heaven and earth, and he was going to use Jacob and his descendants to accomplish his purposes. That was the dream. But in verse 51, Jesus is saying that he is the greater Jacob. Jesus is saying that people will access God through him. In other words, Jesus is the stairway. Jesus is the ladder that connects earth to heaven. Jesus here calls himself the Son of God, and in the rest of the Gospels, he will establish that, that he is the way, he is the truth, and the life, that no one comes to God the Father except through him. He is the, the stairway, he is the ladder, and if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. You can climb that ladder through Jesus. Jesus is telling Nathaniel, I am capable of so much more. You have no idea. The fig tree, seeing you under the fig tree, that was just the beginning. You will see me do so much more greater things than the fig tree. What was Jesus saying here? What was Jesus doing here? Jesus was expanding Nathaniel's vision of what he thought God could do. Who knows, maybe for Nathaniel, the story of the fig tree would have been enough. He could have spent the rest of his life talking about that one experience, talking about that one thing he saw God do, the one thing that happened on that one day. Who knows, maybe for Nathaniel, that story would have been enough. But Jesus tells him, don't be so limited in your thinking. Jesus says, I am capable of so much more, and you are going to see it. You know, this week I've been thinking a lot about this fig tree and how it could easily represent how we think about things sometimes. You know, maybe a few years ago God did something amazing in your life and it was this great moment. It was a great moment of faith for you. It was a great moment to see God work in your life. And you thought back then, wow, this is incredible. And it was. But instead of building on that moment, instead of building on that step of faith, maybe you just sort of stayed there. Maybe even today you still tell that same story of what God did back then. And don't get me wrong, it's, it's a great story. But maybe after that moment of faith, you just became a little bit too comfortable. You got used to how things were working, and everything just seemed to be working Okay. And slowly, over time, without saying it, maybe even without realizing it, you start to think, well, maybe that's the greatest thing that God will ever do in my life. That's it. And with that, you've started to limit God in your mind. You hear stories of God working in other people's lives, and you think, wow, that's great. I'm I'm so thankful for that. But he's not going to do that in me. He's not going to do that through me. Not in some sad way, but just in a very practical way. And you start to think about God the way that I think about that tree stump I tried to jump over when I was a kid. I know I can't jump over that tree stump now, so I'm not even going to try. And perhaps spiritually, you haven't stepped out on faith because you think that moment in your life has passed you by too, that those great stories of faith are over for you. 
So you keep telling that same story of faith from a long time ago. It's a great story, but it's the same story you've been telling for years. To say it another way, you keep telling the story about the fig tree. But Jesus told Nathaniel here, the fig tree is just the beginning. You're going to see me do much greater things than the fig tree. And it's interesting that Jesus says Nathaniel will see greater things. Jesus doesn't say that Nathaniel will do greater things, even though he probably will. But Jesus says he will see greater things. Why is that significant? Because what Jesus is saying here is it's not about what Nathaniel can do. It's not about Nathaniel's talents, his abilities, or even his experiences. It's not about Nathaniel at all. It's about God at work. It's about seeing God work and move right in front of our eyes, changing hearts, performing miracles, all those things we just sang about a moment ago. It's not about Nathaniel doing. It's about Nathaniel seeing what God can do. You know, this is the time of year many of us make resolutions. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. When's the last time instead of that you said, God, I want to watch you do this, and I hope that you do this, and I pray that you do this in my life. As I said earlier, the older we get, the more we realize our limitations. We learn what we're good at, what we're not good at, what we're capable of, what we're not capable of. That's life. That's growing up. But what we should never do is put limitations in our minds on what God can do, what he, he can do in our lives, and what can he, he can do in the lives of people that we know. As we get older, physically and mentally, we will do less things. We'll do lesser things than when we were younger. But we should never put God into that box. God does not do lesser things. God does not grow weary. God does not get tired. What Jesus tells Nathaniel here in verse 51 is that God is in the business of doing greater things. John the Baptist says this later in the Gospel of John. He said, God must become greater. I must become less. Therefore, in this life, we will do less and less, but we should always be prepared to see God do more, more, and more, to see God do greater things, to watch him do more than we thought was ever possible, so that we have new and fresh stories of faith. So we're not just telling that one story from a long time ago. The fig tree wasn't the end. The fig tree was the beginning of the story with Nathaniel. And Jesus promised him that he would see even greater things than that. You know, as we start a, a, a new year, maybe in your life you feel a bit stuck. You're not seeing the movement in certain areas of your life that you hope for. And that can be hard. That can be tough. And sometimes it can feel more safe to not dream so big because that way you won't get disappointed. That way your heart doesn't get hurt or broken. And so we kind of get into maintenance mode, just trying to keep things going the way that they've always been. And instead of having a big and wide vision of what God can do in your life, that vision becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And pretty soon, you're not expecting greater things. In fact, you start to expect worse things. But look at me at John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Jesus came so that through him we might have the abundant life that he offers. In other words, Jesus doesn't want you just to survive. Jesus doesn't want you to just be in maintenance mode. Jesus wants you to live. Life isn't just about existing. Life isn't just about trying to pay the bills. Of course, we have to do those things. But Jesus promised you an abundant life. Life to the full, a life 
of faith, a, a life of getting to see God do amazing and wonderful things, even greater things than he did before in your life. So as we begin this new year, I want to challenge you to exercise more. Not in the physical sense, though I could use that some myself. Maybe you could too. But in the spiritual sense, to exercise your faith, to ask God to do greater things in your life. I love this prayer at the end of, of Ephesians chapter 3, uh, verses 20 and 21. It says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work in us, within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. It's a reminder that God can do so much more than we can imagine or even ask. We might try to limit God in our minds, but you can't limit God. He always does more things. He always does greater things. So we know from these verses that God could do more than you could ever ask. But my question for you this morning is, when's the last time you asked? When is the last time you prayed and asked God to do something greater in your life? Something surprising. Something that would require a huge leap of faith. Jesus said, you don't have because you don't ask. When is the last time you asked? Don't be content to tell that same story of faith from a long time ago. Don't be content to just talk about the fig tree. Ask God to see greater things in your life this year. Remember, it's not about us doing it. It's about watching God do it in and through us, through his power, as it says in Ephesians 3, not in our own power. Those things in your life that don't seem to be moving, you can't move those things by yourself. If you try to move it all by yourself, it won't work. But nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is too heavy for God. Ask him to move those things that seem immovable. If you feel stuck this morning, it's not you who can pull you out of that feeling. It's God. As I said earlier, the Christian life is all about movement. It's all about following Jesus, going somewhere. God doesn't want you to be stuck. Ask him to make a way where there doesn't seem to be a way. You know, my hope for all of us this year is that on December 31st, 2022, that we're not all telling the same old stories of faith that we've been telling before. They're good stories. It's true. But I hope at the end of this new year, we are telling new and fresh stories of the work that God has done in our lives, that we can testify that God did even greater things than we could imagine. And we can just stop and thank God for all that he did in 2022. It is a new year, so let there be new stories. So before I pray, I just want to give you an opportunity to, to pray where you are. You can pray silently or whatever. And pray to God whatever is in your heart. But let me encourage you to pray specifically for one thing. Pray and ask God to do more than you think is possible this year. Ask him this year to do more than you could even imagine. Ask him to do greater things in your life this year. Because God is not in the business of doing lesser things. He's in the business of doing great and greater things. So please pray, and in a few moments, I will close this. But let's pray uh, silently.
Father God, we thank you for this new year. We thank you for your word. God, we thank you for this story of your encounter with Nathaniel. God, and we're just reminded that it's easy to limit you in our minds when, of course, you have no limits. But God, I pray for all of us this year that you would surprise us, that you would do more than we would think is possible, that you would do more than we could ever imagine or even ask. God, we don't want to tell that same story again of faith from long ago. May 2022 be a year full of new stories of faith and trusting you and relying on you. God, you are great. And you have done great things. And we trust you to do even greater things. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or we think, according to the power at work within us, to him glory in the church and in Christ throughout all generations, forever and ever. And everyone said, Amen.